Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to this Wind Power Engineering and Development webinar, Networking the Wind Farm, a closer look at the equipment that ensures production uptime. I'm your host, Paul Dvorak, editor of Wind Power Engineering and Development magazine. Thank you for joining us. And at this time, I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, Redline Controls for sponsoring this webcast. Now, just a brief agenda before I introduce our speaker. This webinar will be available at uh, windpowerengineering.com. A link to it and the slides will be emailed to everyone who is registered. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer session. Now, of course, not everyone that wanted to attend today's webinar could be here, but you can help them learn from it by tweeting the key takeaways and key points that you think important. And your tweets, be sure to include the hashtag WindWebinar. Now, after the presentation, I'll read the questions that you and the audience have submitted. You can do that by type, typing them into the questions box on your GoToMeeting panel that should be to the right of your screen. If it's not, look for a small red arrow and pick on that, and the question box will appear. I'd suggest not waiting till the end of the presentation. Type your questions in as they come to you. and We'll try to answer as many as possible before the time is up. Now let me tell you about our speaker, Barry Turner. He is a network engineering manager for Redline's industrial networking and automation products. With more than 15 years of product sales engineering and network administration experience, Barry has extensive network and communications knowledge in industries that include wind, solar, and other renewable energies. Redline provides industrial products that enable companies worldwide to gain real-time data visibility that drives productivity. As, as a result of the company's Entron and SixNet acquisitions, Redline now offers a comprehensive portfolio of industrial Ethernet switches, cellular devices, and automated automation products that connect, monitor, and control. And with that, let us begin. Barry, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, appreciate uh, you guys having me here. Um, and I'm just going to take about uh, roughly about an hour of your time, and we're going to talk about Ethernet and how that correlates and how we can use it in our wind turbine to provide a, a reliable network uh, just for control and monitoring of, of the equipment you use. Um, so we'll go ahead and forward on into this. And so today what we're going to talk about is uh, networking the wind farm, what it takes to get a network up and going, um, and we're going to go inside the wind turbine itself and look at some of the components. Uh, the networking switches, uh, a little bit at HMIs and how we can use those to uh, get diagnostic data about the network and other devices inside the turbine. And then we're also going to uh, see what we can look at about ensuring uptime. So we're going to look at building a, um, a, a resilient network so that, uh, that if there is any kind of fault anywhere, a uh, fiber outage, a uh, cable, anything like that that might break or Component failure, we have something something that keeps it up and going. So uh, ring is what's going to do that, and we're going to show you how that works and how easy it is to set up. And as far as scalability goes, uh, you know, the, the switches have to, you know, allow that, and, and now we're soon. So uh, select the right media types. We're going to talk about fiber optics because that is used a lot in this type of the network. There's a lot of distance between all of these turbines, and so we need to get fiber optics uh, is what we use to make sure that we can get the distance we need out of that. Uh, copper has some limitations, and um, we'll talk about those. Uh, and then wireless. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, Redline buying Intron and SixNet, um, and they did that because uh, we have uh, some fantastic switch lines, some, some amazing reliable uh, switches. But we have two companies, and both companies have a, a great portfolio of products, but uh, each one has or had uh, a few gaps in there uh, to meet the, uh, the needs of the customer. And so now when the two companies combine together, or now three companies, now we have a complete uh, line you know, through the breadth of product. So you get the best of breed uh, to choose from, and uh, wireless is one of those things that we get to add uh, on the sailor side. And um, we're going to show you how to set up alerts through with the uh, HMI so that you can um, proactively find uh, where faults might occur or anything that might happen and have that email you or send you a text message. And then, like I said, proactively troubleshoot the network using HMI. So we can look at uh, diagnostic data in HMI and pull data out. So, And we'll go ahead and move forward. So with Ethernet is what we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, even it's been around for a long time, about 40 years, roughly 40 years. And um, it, uh, it has evolved a little bit, but uh, for the most part, it stayed intact. The reason it stayed intact is because it was a good plan to begin with. And things have been built on top of it uh, to provide more functionality and expand its features, but the underlying principle is relatively the same. 
because it was like that a great concept. So we're going to look at momentum because um, Ethernet is everywhere, and some of these places you may not actually realize it is, but it is all over the place. You use it every day, of course, and it's in pretty much every communication or facet of communication. Um, and then we're going to look at a few different applications. So, um, so we'll go ahead and move to the next one. And in 1973 is when Ethernet was uh, first thought about by Bob Metcalf at the uh, Palo Alto Center in California. And uh, he came up with a, he needed a network that would allow multiple devices to connect to one medium and have uh, access to other resources on that. And you know today or, or in the past, you used uh, serial type communication, which works fantastic, but it has limitations too. So serial communication has, uh, you know, you have to daisy chain it uh, if you're going to want to extend that out. And then we have distance limitations, we have bandwidth limitations. So going to Ethernet is a very good idea because now we're able to get away from all the limitations that serial has. And plus, when you're using serial, you're kind of tied to a vendor. So you buy a, you pay a premium for a part that connects uh, serial that talks to a particular protocol. But you can use Ethernet, and you don't have to pay that premium uh, like you did in the past. So that's the reason why people uh, buy Ethernet switches or want to move to Ethernet switches. Most all of the equipment that you're buying today has Ethernet port on it. And the reason is because they want ubiquity. Uh, and that's what Ethernet gives you. So uh, Bob Metcalf created the uh, Ethernet uh, based off of the Aloha network. And Aloha network was a network that allowed uh, connection from uh, all these different islands in Hawaii. And it was wireless communication. And so uh, instead of having to get on a uh, ferry to go from island to island to use a centralized computer, they wanted to use a wireless network to do that. And that's what the Aloha network did. The problem is, is that network was very inefficient. So you can see right here, it's about 18% uh, efficient, so there's a lot of overhead and a lot of waste. So uh, Ethernet fixes that, and it uses this uh, protocol here, which is CSMA slash DD. And so what that means is CareSense is able to listen on the line um, and to see if someone else is talking. Because if you have one medium, only one person can talk on that medium at one time. And that's what that does. Multiple access means we can have multiple devices connected to the same medium. And a collision detection. If two people talk at the same time, we have to figure out what to do to make sure that it's rectified. So just like talking with somebody on the phone, um, if both of you talk at the same time, there's a good probability that you, either one of you understand what you were saying. So uh, and Ethernet can be highly effective, or efficient, I'm sorry. Um, and, and it is today. Um, actually, today we don't use CSM, uh, CSMACD as much because we have full duplex communication. This is where um, the momentum comes in. And you look at uh, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010. So roughly 40 years ago uh, is when um, 40 years ago is when Ethernet first came out. You can see that uh, the patent was filed by Xerox in 1975, uh, based off Bob Metcalf's. Um, and just a little trivia, if you guys are into that, uh, Bob Metcalf later went on to form 3Com, and 3Com um, is a company that he ran for quite a while, very successful. Um, and they got their start in making Ethernet adapters. And you can see in the 80s, uh, 3Com ships their first adapter in 81. And in 1985, 3Com sells, you know, uh, you know, 100,000 adapters all, you know, worldwide. So that's a big jump. But and the reason that people jumped on that is because it, it was ubiquity. Uh, you can you can use uh, this card, but you can put it on these different devices, and it works relatively the same way. You can put it in a printer, you can put it in a PC, um, instead of having to pay a premium every time. And then in the 1990s. Um, this is kind of baffles my mind when I think about it, is that the Internet is really roughly 20 years old. So it's 20 years old, but it's something that I check every single day. Every single day I'm on the Internet, and I think that the majority of people are on the Internet every single day. Um, but 20 years ago, we, it didn't exist, or not the form it is today. But we knew nothing about it, but now we use it. So you think about the exponential growth of technology as a whole, as, as we move forward, the, the ramp just goes up you know, sharper and sharper. So, you know, who knows where we're going to be in the next 20 years. So, um, and then in the 2000s, uh, Eastern IP was introduced uh, by Rockwell, and then it was later, uh, you know, uh, shipped over or uh, handed over to the ODDA, and ODVA actually took, takes over ownership of that, and they actually manage it now. So, um, in 2003, we started looking at or having the ability to do King gig, and I added this Verizon Metro Ethernet. Out there, and it's really not important for what we're talking about today, other than the fact that uh, it is an end-to-end -end solution now. 
So um, the technology used to be Ethernet was plugged into the back of your PC or your servers or your end devices, but once you got on the Internet somewhere, you, you cross over a different protocol and use something different. Metro E uses Ethernet, and so it, you're Ethernet from start to finish. And uh, Metro Ethernet is growing fast uh, because it's easy and it is the way it's supposed to. Uh, so 2010, Ethernet is everywhere. And that's absolutely true. So I don't know if you guys keep up with these magazines here, but uh, these magazines had an uh, article in them, and I thought it was very interesting. They saw the, the Internet of Things. And um, in the article, they talk about how everything is going to be connected and everything is going to be smart. And right now we have our smartphones, and we call them smartphones because uh, they are able to anticipate what we need and what we want or, or do a very good job of that. Um, and they want to do that with objects, so uh, just you know things that uh, are out there. Ethernet is going to be the protocol that they use to, to communicate uh, or some form of it. So Ethernet is going to be everywhere. And it continues to grow and expand. Um, and the uh, the Internet of Things is just that. It's uh, you know having the ability to um, move uh, from one location to another location and using my phone to know what I, where I'm going and what I'm doing. And the Internet or you know program will actually anticipate what my needs may be. So as you leave work, uh, you know, you cut off your computer and leave work to go home, you might send a text message uh, to your wife saying that you just left work. Well, it happens automatically because of the program that's in the background. Uh, just like that, you might get home and instead of having to match your, um, you know, your uh, alarm or your um, remote for your uh, garage door, uh, it makes sense that it's your car coming in. It's not to match anything. It just opens as you pull up. So lots of things that are like that. Technology just keeps growing and growing and getting to be a bigger part of our life, which you know, excites me because that's what I do. Um, but uh, the Internet of Things is growing, and it's a very exciting time for anybody in technology, and uh, it's where everything is going to be at. So we look at a couple of different things, uh, a few different applications here. So most or a lot of the TVs that we buy today, especially all the smart TVs, have an Ethernet jack on the back. It's either an Ethernet jack on the back or we have a wireless card that's inside the TV, but we have that in our TV. If you look back 10 years ago, we would have never actually anticipated. I would have never thought that I would have had an Ethernet jack on my TV. Um, at home, I actually don't have cable and I don't have satellite. Uh, I have uh, an Apple TV and I have uh, I stream all my media, and that's, that's, the way I, that's the way I do my entertainment. And that is kind of the way that people are going uh, as we move forward, uh, people are using their cell phones now instead of using the landline, um, you know, because technology is taking over. And Ethernet is at the core of that. So you look at uh, businesses, consumers, you got home automation, which is a growing market. You got uh, process control uh, type stuff in manufacturing. We're able to build stuff quicker, uh, cheaper, and better using machines and Ethernet as a communication. And so um, and you look at media, uh, so uh, streaming media. You know, we need more bandwidth for that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, so, and of course, wind turbines. So, Ethernet is definitely here. These are actually, you know, uh, autonomous systems that are producing energy using the wind. So, they take kinetic energy and they produce that. So, how are we going to build for that? We have to be able to monitor that. We have to know that it's working all the time and we have to meter it. And so, that's what Ethernet allows you to do is take that data that you're pulling out with whatever sensors or control devices you have in this turbine and then uh, send that data somewhere else to be collected and manipulated so that you, it makes sense to you and so that you know what you're actually producing. So you know, you know what you're building and um, you can get trend analysis, all kinds of data uh, used in Ethernet. But you couldn't get that before. If you just stuck these guys out there and let them run, of course they wouldn't run. You know, Even if we knew how to build turbines that work the way that they do today, uh, without some type of control, they would, they would end up you know, self-destructing. Uh, they have to know where the wind is coming from. Uh, they have to know what, how fast they're going. Uh, and all that stuff has to happen inside the, the turbine itself, and that data ends up being transmitted on the Ethernet at the back. So, um, and uh, uh, one of the things that's happening right now is retrofitting these wind turbines. There's tons of turbines throughout the world, and you know, it's time to retrofit them. And why is it time to retrofit them? Because they're not near as efficient as they once were. Um, we have new uh, ways of doing things. We have new devices that we can put in there that will do what we need it to. Um, and so we can increase the efficiency, we can increase monitoring capabilities, and we can increase our control or enhance our control 
so that we, uh, we have better, more granular control over what's going on out there. Uh, now we have redundancy that we can put out there. Uh, lots of stuff we didn't have 20 years ago. So like I said, you look at the exponential growth of technology as a whole, and that, you know, any technology you look at has had exponential growth um, throughout. So um, we want to make sure that uh, uh, we want to drive efficiency. So we're going to add more sensors, and we're going to um, have more data points. We have better control, deeper monitoring capabilities. So if we go up inside the turbine here, if we look at the devices, you know, these this turbine may be uh, have been up here for 20 years, but the controls in it relatively new, um, except for uh, if they've been retrofitted. But um, if it's a very efficient turbine, the controls are new. Um, they have better functionality out of it. So that's the reason why people are retrofitting these is to increase um, the capacity and increase the performance in these turbines so that you can put better controls in it, uh, better monitoring capabilities in it, so that turbine as an investment is producing more money for you. And then um, now we can increase uh, productivity by allowing you to do remote monitoring. So in the past, um, you know, how would we get data out of this turbine? Well, very few ways to do that. Um, you know, wireless has always been around. Cellular has been around for quite a while. And um, but the amount of data that we can actually pull from that has been not quite as much as what we need. So now with wireless uh, getting up there where it needs to be, with LTE coming into play, and with um, 802.11n coming into play, now we can we have enough bandwidth to actually produce the data that we need to collect. And so um, we get more visibility in our network because we can look deeper. Uh, we get quicker response times when something goes wrong because we have alerting features. And we, since these devices, or since these turbines are all connected to one another, but they may not be connected to the internet directly, we can allow, uh, like I say, a router sitting out on, on one of the turbines that actually communicates everything back. And so, um, and then we enhance preventative maintenance. So uh, we can schedule, um, you know, work to be done at a certain time. We can look at, uh, you know, what's going on, what the trend is, uh, what the performance is at that particular tournament, and make sure we get out somebody out there to actually do whatever maintenance needs to take place. And um, instead of having to send somebody to the turbine, um, just to guess. So it allows us to become proactive instead of reactive, which is what everybody likes much better and works better. So enhanced control, so we, we increase or we can get better braking now, which means that we're going to extend the life of the, the turbine. So a lot of these turbines that uh, had some uh, issues that um, may have uh, not worked out the way that uh, the installer had hoped, a lot of that is because uh, the, the braking didn't work exactly like it should. The control mechanism didn't work just like it should. So as we retrofit these uh, turbines, we're able to put better controls and better devices out there to do that. Um, and like I said, all the devices that you're buying now have an Ethernet interface on it. So um, any more uh, pitch control, um, so that means that we can control it better and we just make sure this turned to the wind uh, properly and all that data gets on the network somewhere. So everything, uh, you know, what I did in my, in my past life before I, I started working with Red Lion, and I've been here for about two years, was well, network administration. And network administration, you have data that transfers from a client to a server or to the internet to the server or back and forth, but I didn't realize how deep Internet or Ethernet is involved in uh, communication with essentially everything. So, um, you know, traffic light controls, for example, um, you know, way stations, toll bridges, everything has Ethernet at the background, including these Ethernet or uh, these um, turbines here, which have Ethernet um, on the background or backbone. Um, more control, you got more power out of that, and that's why we're retrofitting these towers. So what about remote access? Uh, like I said before, now that we have Wi-Fi and we have cellular, now we can connect in remotely into these guys and pull the data out. What if we think something's going wrong or we're not producing the amount of power that we should out of a particular turbine, we're able to connect into that remotely without having to send technician all the way out there, and we do diagnostic uh, work on what the tower's doing. So we can figure out you know, why it's not performing like it should um, without having you know, the cost of sending somebody out there and having to send them all the way up to the tower to take a look at it. Um, and, you know, it could be just a software change. So, um, and then, you know, in the past, people would have connections with, like, uh, a T1 line or um, ISDN or something like that, and those lines end up costing a pretty good bit of money. But now with cellular, uh, with Wi-Fi communication, we can allow uh, Wi-Fi to cost you nothing uh, as a monthly fee. You know, you, you pay for the, the radio itself at the very beginning, 
And then the Wi-Fi communication is unlicensed, so you use what you need to. Sailor, you pay for a machine-to-machine Sailor connection, and you pay a very low amount uh, for the amount of data that you're actually pulling down. And so it, it's, you know, cost comparison, Sailor is much better than a T1 connection would ever be. Um, and then, uh, reduce, like I said, reduce the, the need for on-site visits because now we're able to proactively see what's going on in the network without having to get out there and get into the turbine and go all the way up to you know, manually inspect what's happening. So quick response time, of course, that uh, enables that because uh, you don't have to go out there. And then uh, enables predictive maintenance, of course. And then let's see. So let's go inside the turbine right quick. So fiber uh, between towers, and this is what just a typical uh, turbine or wind farm is going to look like. It's going to have a wind turbine scattered throughout um, at the optimum elevation uh, for the, the environment there. And um, we're going to have a, a turbine here, but there's going to be a long distance between each one of the turbines. Um, and the only way to get there, because copper has a limitation of 328 feet, uh, the only way to get there is, is fiber optic cables. So we're going to use fiber optic cables to go between the turbines, and we may use copper inside the turbine itself um, as long as we can, we can get there. Um, and so this shows you just that. It shows an Ethernet switch, and there's a ring, uh, and the ring that allows us redundant connection between each one of the towers. And so, um, and the ring connects all together. And with in ring, which is our proprietary protocol that allows uh, fast heal time, uh, heal time you're looking at about 30 milliseconds. With uh, the standard for IT um, bring protocol, which is RSTP, uh, your heal time is about one to three seconds. Well, the, the problem with that, one to three seconds, a lot of things can happen, and we need it to happen immediately, and we need, we need to know that uh, the, these PLCs and these drives are communicating, and there's a scan time in it. We want to make sure that that scan time doesn't, uh, we don't miss that scan time. And so we need a very fast heal time on our ring, and that's what in-ring offers. Um, and then um, the ring ensures uptime because, like I said, if you if you were to have an equipment failure or a fiber optic failure, say they someone cut the fiber in one spot, the the ring itself would be healed in 30 milliseconds, which is very fast. And so your PLCs would communicate if you had peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication between your PLCs between your towers, they would never know that there was a you know an outage anywhere in the network. Um, and HMIs allow you to monitor the network at uh, you know in, in the nacelle. From the base, so you don't have to go all the way up there to see exactly what the what the device is up top. Going. So this is uh, our G3 HMI, and um, if any of you guys have ever used it, it's fantastic. HMI it has uh, scripts on the back end, which is software that allows you to easily program uh, the, the HMI and pull the data out. And um, the that's a 708FX2, which is just an Ethernet switch that we have, which is a, a kind of our sweet spot for our Ethernet switches. Um, if you don't need a modular Ethernet switch. Um, but the same thing holds true about most of those products as far as ease of use. So most of those you can pull out of the box and have them up and going very quickly. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about or look at whenever I show you um, how to set up in ring and exactly how easy it is. Did you look at doing a ring? It seems like it might be complicated. Well, with uh, the software engineers have made it so that it's not for so these particular switches. So, um, so I, I mentioned earlier we have a limitation of 328 feet for copper. Um, and since we have that limitation, we can't go above that. What if you have a, you know, 400 foot tower out there, and we need to go past that? Um, what will we do? Well, you put an Ethernet switch in the middle, and that Ethernet switch is going to act as a repeater, do the same exact thing. It's going to pull the data in, and then you have another reset of 328 feet on top of that. Um, if you have a tower that you can't get there, you can't put anything in the middle, then fiber optics will be what you want to use to get all the way to the top. And so we have 100 meters is our maximum for Cat5, Cat5e. That's uh, Cat6, 8 also. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the uh, the media types in just a little bit. So if you look inside the, the turbine, it might look something like this. Um, and this is just uh, just a diagram we have on some white papers, and you guys have seen it before. But um, if you look at the shock and vibration specs on our Ethernet switch, it is very high. And um, it, it's really high. Uh, especially compared to our competition. And the reason it's so high is because we've been in wind for quite a while, and we um, we know what what happens. We know the, what needs to happen, and we know that uh, Ethernet switch might have to be in that in the hub. And so if it's in there, uh, controlling, uh, helping control the pitch of those blades, then um, or passing the data that controls the pitch of those blades, then it needs to you know have a, 
a high shock and vibration spec, and which all of our switches do. And so um, that's what what we're showing here is that when you're putting in a network, you got to make sure that the product that you're putting in there meets the specs for the environment. And so um, I, I do like uh, I teach an Ethernet class where we talk about uh, Ethernet 101 and uh, what it's used for and how it works. And one of the things that I talk about is uh, if everybody has Ethernet at home, and so you have a Linksys router at home that you get access to the internet. And when your daughter complains that she can't get access to the internet, what do you do? Well, you go downstairs and you find the uh, the hub or the switch that you use fault, and you power it off, you power it back on, and within a few minutes she's back up and going, and everybody's good. And but in a situation like this, you don't you don't have that luxury. You can't reboot these things. They have to be running all the time. So you need a hardened switch. You need a very reliable switch. So um, and you, you know you want a switch that you can put in place. And it's very easy to configure um, and it just runs, and that's exactly what we have. So extreme temperatures again, we have to match the product for the environment that's going to be in, and it seems to be all over the place. And uh, they could be in the cell where it's very very hot um, because of all the the power being produced up there, but it could be in the base where it's very cold. Um, it could be you know almost anywhere. And these towers can be anywhere. So you look at uh, scorching heat, the Arctic cold, uh, humidity. There's all these things, these factors that you have to pay attention to when you're putting your equipment in here. And so if you put a consumer um, type switch or uh, device in there, you're going to see failures. If you see failures, then you're not going to be pulling, you know, you're not going to be able to control your uh, tower like you need to. You're not going to be able to pull the data out that you need to. And um, it's just a bad, a bad idea. So um, the first column on this particular slide is where I spent most of my life uh, doing network. And so uh, there was always a, a closet uh, that all the data was housed in, or that the data equipment was housed in. But it was always air conditioned, and, and then uh, you know we had a filter in there, so there wasn't a whole lot of uh, dust, and the, the equipment was taken care of. The problem is, is that there there will be a lot of dust. There will be a lot of environmental um, Properties that you you can't you can't isolate these, this equipment from uh, you know from not putting it in some type of a box. So you want a very hardened um, device, and that's what we have now. So you're looking at negative 40 to 85 C, and then you look at shock and vibration, um, 50 to 200 Gs, um, and we've got over voltage protection at each one of the ports. Uh, so you got 16 kV um, diodes at uh, at each one of the ports on your Ethernet interface, and then mean time between failure. Uh, and that's huge. And you see that the typical commercial switch is about 25,000 hours. And that, that's it. That's not a long time, right? Uh, and part of the reason why that, um, that it's like that is because it has a fan on the inside of it that runs. And that fan has a bearing in it, and that, those, those do go bad. So if you have a switch that has no moving parts, it's less likely to go bad. And hours don't have a fan in it. Um, and that's the reason why. So building, deploying uh, a resilient network and a scalable network, we're going to select the right media type, and we're going to use wireless to remotely monitor the performance and proactively troubleshoot the network using HMI. And so we're going to be able to take a look at uh, what the HMI is going to tell us about what's going on in the network uh, quickly and easily. Um, and just a few points we're going to touch on. If you see this, this is bad. Uh, if you see this, this is good, that kind of stuff. And then wireless to remote uh, the performance, so like I said before, um, we're just going to talk about how we could use wireless and uh, cellular in combination with one another to actually provide a solution without having to run fiber optic cables between each one of these towers. Now, um, wireless is you're not ever going to get the same speeds that you are uh, potentially able to get using wire connection, uh, um, but a lot of times running a fiber optic cable or putting something in the ground is cost prohibitive and wireless is a better solution. So, um, sourcing the right media type, we're just going to talk about uh, you know, like I said before, the different kind of cables, the, the connectors, and why we're using, why a Cat5 cable is different than any other cable that has, uh, you know, power conductors in it. Um, you know, if you're an electrician, a conductor is a conductor. Um, however, uh, network engineering, uh, there, there's a lot of things you have to pay attention to, and there's this media is twisted uh, to make sure that the signal gets where it should get to. You know, this could be a network, and you see that uh, you got ring A, ring B, ring C, ring D. And we have these rings out here. And if we were to lose any one of these Ethernet switches for whatever reason, power outage, which happens a lot, um, and any kind of network, the uh, the power is is the point of failure most often. And so we have redundant inputs on the power supply on all of our Ethernet switches. So you could have multiple uh, 
power supplies or you can have a power supply and a battery backup, how are you felt most comfortable doing it? But um, it, so you were to have a power outage um, at right here, say the uh, switch at the very top. If you were to have that switch uh, fail uh, for a power outage or whatever it may be, the rest of the network is still up and going. So if this was a path that the data was flowing um, before and that switch were to go offline or we were to lose a fiber optic connection, we need something that's going to heal up very quickly, and that's what N-Ring does. Uh, like I said, N-Ring heals in about 30 milliseconds. And so if we had peer communication in our PLCs um, here to here uh, or wherever, let's say maybe this one, this guy down here, we have 30 milliseconds between this whole network. And the way we do that is we have these uh, three or these four rings here, and uh, we're connecting these three rings to the main ring using a protocol or another proprietary protocol called Enlink. And Enlink allows that uh, same heal time we have with Enring. Uh, just we have these four switches that allow us to do that. And so that we have a primary and a, a standby link. And if we were to lose a primary, we'd switch over to the standby link in 30 milliseconds. So it's, it's very critical because we, we want to make sure that we are always getting the data that we need out of these turbines and that we're always able to communicate with the turbine. Uh, you know, if you were to lose communication completely to a turbine, how long would it take or how long uh, would it take you to get out there uh, and how stressed would you be before you got out there to figure out what's going on? I mean, think about all the things that could go wrong for the turbine just run itself um, without any monitoring. So uh, you need something that heals very quickly. And then, again, you got metering. You need to make sure that the power that you're producing, uh, you're, you're able to build for it. Quick little video that I'll show you uh, on how uh, easy it is to set up uh, entering. And, um, Enring is just a uh, th that protocol, and um, normally when you're setting up a uh, ring on a network, you have to set up a lot of stuff. You have to do a lot of things. You have to jump through hoops. You have to make sure you tell it which one is this and, and what's that and how it's going to connect uh, with the intron switches, the intron switch line. Uh, the only thing you have to do is set the ports the way that they should, which means plugging them in the right ports, port one and port two, uh, carry on the ring. Uh, it's either the first two ports or the last two ports, and then log into one of the switches and make a change from auto member to master. You don't have to log into every switch. You only have to log into one. And so uh, in this demo, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to log into one of the switches um, because all the switches have a default IP address of it uh, on them. And I'm going to log into one switch, change the IP address to something unique so that I can log back into it uh, just so I can show you what it's doing. And I've got, uh, what is this, uh, two ports. These switches that are uh, around the ring, and when one fails, uh, the other one will pick up, and the heal time is, is 30 milliseconds. So what you'll see is I'll add an IP address, and then I'll reboot the switch, bring it back up, log back into the same switch, and then I'll take and enable in ring. I'll save and reset, and once I save and reset, you'll see that the uh, the in ring is up. Now, uh, when I did this video, and I, I did the video because I, if you have multiple connections uh, to two different networks, um, you could have problems and so I did a video beforehand and so whenever I try to connect to the switch the, at the very beginning you'll see that uh, that there, it page can't be displayed. The reason it can't be displayed is because I'm not connected to the internet. I'm just connected to these uh, switches that I, was, that I was configuring. So we'll go ahead and click play on the um, video. And so the ring manager is the switch that I'm logging into, that uh, 708TX uh, at the very top. I'm logging into that guy and just making a couple of changes. Uh, one is going to be the IP address, and the other is going to be the um, um, setting up the ring itself. So this is the, end, uh, the ring manager. You have one switch on the ring that is the manager and it's taking care of the ring throughout. This is where I'm pulling up Internet Explorer. I'm just logging into the default IP address of the switch. I'm sorry, I know you guys can't see the IP address I'm typing in there, but it's a default. Um, I'm just logging in with the uh, default using the password of the switch. And the first thing I'm going to do is administration and then system and then modify. And the default IP address will get changed from 201 at the, in the last octet to 203. I'm going to save it and reset. So just uh, save the settings and it does a power cycle. Once it comes back up, I'm going to log back into it. Uh, the switch will actually, the software and switch is actually going to forward me to the new IP address, which is 192.168.1.203. And it's going to reset that switch, and then it's going to forward me to it so I can log back in. And I'll make a change for in ring. Take the switch just a second. I'm logging back in now. I'm logging back in. I'm going to go down here to um, in ring and configure, mode, modify. 
and auto member all the switches shift as auto members. I'm just going to change that to uh, member, manager, I'm sorry. And then uh, you select which ports. Like I said, it can be the first port, first uh, two ports or the last two ports. And I'm using TX1 and TX2. I'm going to disable RSTP, which is uh, the default. Save and reset. And as soon as the switch comes back up, it's going to um, tell all the other switches that it is now the ring manager and that uh, a ring is formed. And so they kind of fall in line and, and uh, do what they're supposed to do in the past, uh, the health packets around in the ring so that uh, we're able to give you a 30 millisecond hail time. Uh, and there's a lot of different indicators on a ring. So if a ring were to fail, if you're using that industry standard that I talked about before, with rapid span transfer, you, there would be no way to tell where the ring failed. You would just, or the, the redundant connection failed. You just know that um, you might have had a broadcast on. So now we see the green line at the top, end ring is okay. I know you can't read that. But that, uh, that in, this is on the end ring uh, manager shows us that the ring is okay. And if we were to have an outage uh, at any point, then it would have to turn red. And this page shows us that we have this many switches in our ring, and we had uh, six switches there, but uh, shows the IP address as the ring manager, which is the 203. The rest of them are the default IP address. I mean, I didn't change them. I didn't log into them. Everything is factor default. So um, this is how much time it takes to set up an in-ring, which is very little. And um, I can use, uh, we have a software called uh, InView. You can use InView to monitor the switches. Uh, so without putting an IP address on them at all, you can actually figure out exactly what's going on your network. And that in-view uh, data that gets produced from our switches is actually what we end up collecting and using uh, in the uh, HMI to see what's going on. So, um, and that is about it on the in-ring. But you can see it's very, very easy to do. And so um, part of the, the success that we've had with the intron line is that the switches are very easy to use, but they have advanced features. So if you don't need them, you don't, you don't have to have them. So most of the guys that are using our equipment, they're not network engineers, and they really don't want to be network engineers, but I do know a lot about the applications that they use. But they have learned that Ethernet seems to be the backbone uh, of the data, so they have to know something about it. Well, with an intron switch, you know, we, we give you kind of the same experience that Apple used to give uh, in, in years past. Just put something in your hand that you can use, and it just works, and that's what this does. So it just works. Very easy. So using the, uh, the in-ring technology, so the uh, Ring manager sends a, uh, a health packet around the ring to make sure that it's intact. Once it fails, it does a repeat attempt a couple of times, and then it, uh, at 30 milliseconds, it will heal. So if it's broken. And so you get reporting features with this that you don't get with RSTP, that you don't get with a lot of ring protocols. Uh, like I said, if a, if a failure were to occur, it would just occur, and you would have no way of knowing exactly where it is. You'd have to go hunt down the, the loss. So if somebody cut a, a fiber optic connection somewhere because they were, uh, you know, laying a line down or something like that and cut your fiber down, you might not know where it is without logging in each one of the switches and see which, which port's down. With in-ring, we're going to say exactly which switch it is and which port on that switch uh, has, has seen the value. So um, it automatically heals, and if the, if the uh, ring breaks for whatever reason, it's just a daisy chain like you were before. So you want to fix it you know, as quickly as possible, but you're still up and going for the foreseeable future. I need to hurry up just a little bit, but AMC.3 is the standard for Ethernet, and Ethernet is, uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's the base. It's the core uh, protocol that everything else is stacked on top of. Um, and when it very when it was first invented or created, it was uh, you know, 10 megabits per second to reduce it. Uh, but the distance that we could go was 100 meters or 328 feet. Uh, that um, I believe is the, the guys that actually manage that and maintain that. It was ratified uh, to AMC.3U. And uh, we increase the speed. We increase the speed by changing the clocking mechanism, um, and we're able to get more bandwidth out of it. So now we're looking at 100, 100 base tier uh, TX or FX. So the FX stands for fiber. The T stands for uh, uh, twisted pair. And the MM that you see in this uh, column right here is multi-mode. And then the SM is single mode. And we have two different types of fiber, single mode and multi-mode, and, and both of them have different properties. So the multi-mode is going to be what we use uh, for a shorter distance, so up to two kilometers, and then the single mode is anything past two kilometers, all the way up to 80 kilometers. And so it's the um, the fiber optic um, has different properties in, in, as far as how thick it is and what kind of light uh, we're using to produce, uh, or what we use as a light source, and that's what it terms of the, the, the distance we're able to get of it. We verified yet again, so you look at uh, 802.3z, and we have a thousand base C or a, a gig. And that's what people are using the gabit today. Now, this uh, a gig connection is not what we always need. 
Um, most of the data on your network, 100, 100 base data is just on. So 100 meg switch is what a lot of people usually get for this type of application because we're not sending a lot of data. We're just sending a lot of packets per second, but we're not sending really big packets. So we don't need a huge pipe. We don't need we don't need to pay a premium for a gigabit Ethernet uh, at every one of the ports because we're not producing a gig of, of traffic. And so you, you buy a 100 meg switch with maybe a gig backbone. And so your ring may be a gig, but the ports, the individual ports themselves that uh, connect to the end devices will be 100 meg. So again, we didn't really change the distance on the copper. We can still only go uh, 328 feet or 100 meters. But uh, with the uh, SX and LX, it would be short haul or long haul. So that uh, SX would be multi-mode. And you can go up to uh, 550 meters. If we went with um, the long haul or the single mode fiber, then we would look at uh, going 10 kilometers to 70 kilometers. Um, and I think that's about all that we need to talk about on that particular slide. And then uh, the next one, we're talking about Ethernet uh, copper. So it started with CAT1, uh, and most of all, the, well, the twist pair did come from the telephone side of the thing. So the telephone has been using twist pair for quite a while because of the, the way that they need to send data, that they've been around a lot longer. Um, but we've, we've adopted ways they use twist pair so we can uh, make sure that the signal continue on, continues on its uh, distance that it needs to. And so we look at CAT5, CAT5E, and CAT6A. Those are the ones that are used primarily today. Um, we get asked a lot of times because most of your IT data uh, guys are going to be using CAT 6A, which is kind of the, the newer stuff. Um, and they want to you know, dictate what you put out there. You may be talking to someone um, that's actually going to do install of your, of your copper, and, and he says you need CAT 6A. There's a little bit of a premium for CAT 6A over CAT 5E, but there's really not a need for it. CAT uh, 6A, the only advantage that you get over uh, CAT 6A that you don't have with CAT 5E is the fact that you can do 10 gig. And uh, you can only go, you know, up to a gig with CAT 5D. With uh, CAT 6A, you can go up to 10 gig. And like I said, we're not needing a whole lot of bandwidth on most of these, or uh, the majority of these applications. Um, we just need a lot of packets per second to be able to pro uh, process. And so CAT 5E will work in most all applications. If somebody uh, pushes and says, okay, we're going to pick CAT 6A in, uh, that's fine. It will still work just the same. Uh, just know that it'll, the cable itself and actually, um, Punching the cables down and all that kind of stuff will probably cost a little bit more, not a lot, but a little bit more. But uh, it's not always needed. So these are what uh, the copper looks like. You got uh, um, EIA 568A and 568B, and these are just different standards. And really, the only difference between these two pictures here, um, A and B, is the center receive. So if you look at uh, the green and the orange, uh, they're just twisted or they're, they're swapped. And so the green and the orange are the center receive. And so when um, when you're using two devices that are light devices talking to each other, you have to swap the center receive. And so it's just like a, a telephone. You've got one part you listen to and one part you talk on. And if you're talking to somebody else, they're they're swapped. They have uh, something up to their ear that you're listening to and something they're talking to on the other side. And so we have to swap the center receive when we're talking with light devices like that. So if you had two PCs that you were trying to talk with one another, or two switches that you're trying to talk with with one another, you would use a crossover cable to talk to do that conversation. So, um, so it would switch the send receive for you. And um, so, if uh, a crossover cable is just got A on one side and B on the other side, and um, that's what we used in the past. And it's not that important uh, now because uh, most switches do what's known as auto, auto MDIX, which does that in the, the switch itself. Most PCs do it too. And so it detects to see if it needs to switch it, and it does it for you. And this other uh, picture here is just showing you the uh, copper in, or the, uh, the RJ45 connector and the conductors that uh, actually make contact to the conductors in the cable. And this is what fiber optics look like. Um, of course, you got a couple of different ends there, and uh, we're missing some pictures, but uh, we'll be okay. We've got multi-mode, single-mode uh, fiber connectors, and we've got. Uh, the way the fiber is um, measured, I guess, or um, you've got multi-mode is 50 or 62.5 slash 125 micron. That first number is going to tell you exactly how thick the fiber optic cable on the inside is. And so, uh, you know, you, you think about um, how thick it is. If you look at the single mode at the bottom, that's 8 to 10. So it's a good big difference between the single mode and the multi-mode and the thickness of the fiber optic cable itself. And so um, the multi-mode is going to use an LED as a light source. And an LED, of course, is a lot cheaper um, than a laser, a lot less expensive than a laser is going to cost you to, uh, to produce. 
And so you, that's the reason why multi-mode um, transceiver modules cost a lot less than single-mode transceiver modules. Um, but you get more distance when you're using laser. So if uh, you're going in close proximity, then multi-mode may be what you want to use. Um, but you, if you're using multi-mode, the fiber has to be multi-mode. Uh, the one image that I actually show in here is an uh, SC type connector. And uh, there's just, uh, think about it, it snaps in SC. Uh, and ST is, uh, kind of looks like a BNC type connector uh, where you push it in, it's got a little spring loaded, and uh, it, it hugs in. And so uh, a benefit to that is if there's any vibration at all, it, it's spring loaded and it's actually twisted on there. So uh, if there's vibration, that'll help you. LC is kind of the uh, type in that's the, the new standard. Most of all of our gigabit switches use an LC, or all of our gigabit switches use an LC type connector, and it takes up a lot, a lot less footprint on the front of the, uh, the switch itself. Now this one right here shows us a um, wireless and how we can use cellular and Wi-Fi together. This is an application um, that they have these, all these turbines all over the area, and it's in the middle, middle of the mountains. And um, the, uh, the the wind farm was owned by one person, so you want to pull all the data back in to one location. However, you see the distance there. The distance from resident A to uh, turbine three is about seven miles. So that's a good distance there. So you're looking at fiber optic cable is going to be going to cost you a lot of money. Um, so we were able to do the analysis and do the um, the link budget calculations uh, to tell them what kind of equipment you would need to actually go from here uh, from resident A over to turbine three and pass traffic at, uh, you know, at a distance of seven miles. And so we have to, you know, there's different antennas that we have with our wireless devices, but, but we can do that. Um, now, one thing that we can't do, uh, wireless is line of sight, so you have to be able to see where you're going to. Um, so if you look down here at the very bottom, this is a, a ridge here. And so if we were trying to go from uh, resident A to, to turbine six, that would never happen because they didn't have line of sight between each other. Um, so what we would end up doing is uh, either pulling that data back to Turbine 3 with another radio um, or using Sailor to, to, um, to connect that particular turbine back to the network. And so you got a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and usually uh, a mix of the two is, is the best way to get, get there. So here's our um, HMI, the G3. Like I said, it's a very um, very easy to use software, it's a very sticky product. If someone uses the um, the, software, the um, Crimson software, you know they're pleased with it and they don't really want to move away because it does exactly what it should do. It's easy to use, and um, we can you see we can pull in port statistic data from the end view uh, that's produced on the the intron switches, and so um, we can monitor our switches in real time, and so uh, we can actually put up set up alerts so if something were to power down and the Ethernet interface was not plugged in anymore for whatever reason uh, or wasn't receiving a signal, then we could alert us ourselves with uh, text messaging or email. So in this video is just, uh, it's a web interface of uh, G3. I'm just showing you um, on the video instead of showing, it, uh, showing you actually what it looks like, but it's very similar to this. So we got switch one and switch two, and um, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to click one of the switches and then uh, I'm going to click one of the ports and show you this data that's being pulled out of the switch itself and um, and you can't really read that IP address. But it shows you the IP address of the switch, it shows you the model number of the switch, the MAC address of the switch, all this data being produced and collected by the HMI. And this is port one, and again you can't read all these counters here, but these are tons of different counters that are, that the HMI is collecting and we could set these counters up if we knew what we were wanting to look for, for, uh, for example collisions is something that uh, causes some problems on your network. Uh, if you have a half duplex connection, you're going to get collisions. What if you have a duplex mismatch? You would have collisions on that connection, but you may not know that that's happening. So we could uh, set up uh, an alarm to look for those and then send us a text message if something were to happen. We could do that on, uh, you know, too much bandwidth going through or too much being used, a uh, broadcast storm, tons of different things that we can alert uh, on using the G3 HMI. Uh, we have a DSP which is a product very similar. So you can pull up a, a screen that looks just like this with a DSP, um, and it has the same exact software. You can figure it the exact same way. It just doesn't have a touch screen, else, um, screen on it um, that you can have up there. Now, one of the benefits of the, uh, the DSP that you guys would be interested in is as you retrofit these towers, you'll be pulling some equipment out and putting new equipment in. So you may have a PLC from one manufacturer uh, talking to a PLC of another manufacturer if that's what you would like to have happen. 
but uh, these PLC manufacturers may not all have the same protocol installed or working talking together. The DSP will actually do protocol conversion, so it'll talk from one protocol language to another one for you, so it acts in the middle. So you don't have to just pull everything out of the tower. You can do it, uh, you know, in, in a phase process instead of doing it all at once. And so uh, what I'm showing you in this video right here is just that we can pull that data out of the switch itself and visualize it on HMI. So you could walk over to the base of the tower, you could have access to the network statistics without having to go all the way up there. Uh, you can get network statistics from the from the G3 without having to be a network administrator. You, know, you can you can have it preset to give you the information you need instead of having to get you a Wireshark capture every time and, and see what's going on. And so it's uh, quick and easy. So I think we're getting close on time here, but uh, just a couple of takeaways here. So we, we talked about how to build and deploy uh, redundant networks so that we have plenty of uptime and that we make sure that everything is functioning and communicating. And then um, we're going to safeguard against failure by putting the right equipment in these turbines. So we'll make sure we put a very hardened, rugged equipment in, out there, and we don't put uh, you know commercial or uh, consumer edition type uh, products out there. And monitoring control, um, you know, it's huge. We want to be able to monitor what's going on in the network. We want to be able to control what's going on. And uh, we uh, at Redline allow you to collect that data, and we can allow you to do some control um, with it and uh, release site visits in real time by allowing remote access. So now that we have cellular and we have Wi-Fi, uh, you don't have to pay or, or you know, incur all the costly expenses by putting uh, T1 lines and, and that kind of stuff out there. Um, and then you're proactive. Instead of having to wait for something to happen, uh, you can monitor it as you go, and, you, and, and there's no hidden costs or maintenance expenses that are incurred there. So with that, Paul? Okay. Thank you very much, Barry. And this, is a, this is a good reminder. I keep thinking wind farms are... I made it just wind turbines, but, but there's a lot more to them than that, isn't there? Well, there we've got some there. questions. We've got an inquisitive bunch, so let's get right to those, okay? At the okay. risk of being too repetitive, I'll ask the first one from Clay. He asks, how fast can the entrance ring heal? 30, 30 milliseconds. 30 milliseconds, right, pretty fast. Okay. Now, uh, and, and George asks, even with the fast end ring heal times, Ethernet is Ethernet still non-deterministic? And you might have to explain non-deterministic. Okay, so deterministic means that um, if a device on the other side loses communication, we need to know, you know immediately what happens. And um, normally, Ethernet uh, isn't deterministic. Uh, you know, if you're sitting at your PC and you're trying to get access to the Internet and you click to go to a website and you press Enter, if the website's not available, there's a timeout. Well, that timeout could you know, take a few seconds before you actually get uh, a page can't be dis displayed. But in a control type network, you want that that happen immediately. So if the PLC or the driver has stopped communicating with whatever device it was communicating with, you need to know it uh, right away. And so Ethernet, um, Ethernet IP, for example, was built on top of Ethernet to, to add that deterministic uh, nature to it. So Ethernet doesn't have it natively, natively but protocols have been built on top of it um, that allow that. And Ethernet IP is just one example of many that make that happen. So um, we have plenty, uh, well, tons and tons uh, people, Ethernet IP is the protocol that is used uh, predominantly uh, throughout the United States and um, um, in a large part in the world, and it, that's what it does. It gives you a deterministic network, and so it uh, changes the way that uh, traditional TCP IP works and adds things on top of it to make sure that it communicates successfully. And if a driver were to fail, then the PLC knows right away. Okay, very good. Um, George asks another question that's on my mind too: Is what type of fiber connector do you see the industry standardizing on? Um, as you go, uh, if you're looking at 100 meg, um, the it's going to be ST. That's what I see for the most part. ST type connector, and ST is probably my favorite because, like I said, it's got that uh, stab and twist, or it's got a BNC type connector. You can push it in and twist it, and it's locked in place. A snap is a plastic, or the SC is a plastic, and it snaps in there. It's still great. But uh, if there's any vibration, it wouldn't be quite as good as an ST would be. If you once you move up to a gig, you're going to look at an LC type connector, and it's a smaller uh, connector, and it connects to what is known as a SFP module, a small form factor pluggable module, and um, that's where everything's going that are gigabit. Okay, very good. Uh, Peter asked this question: Are you using multi-mode fiber with ST, SC, or LC connectors? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we see people use uh, multi-mode on all those different connectors, for sure. Okay, very uh, good. The, the main thing is if, you're, if you have a short connection, 
the multimode is going to be what you want to use. And because multimode uses an LED instead of a laser, uh, we want to use that for shorter runs. We want to use a laser type connector or a single mode uh, module when we have a, a longer distance, so above two kilometers. Okay, I understand that. Okay, uh, George asks, does N-ring facilitate redundant fiber also? No. Um, it's going to be on one fiber connection, so the ring is just one ring. We don't have a dual ring, uh, but like I said, we have reporting features in it, and we have, uh, you know, um, alerting systems that, that we can put in place. Like we talked about the HMI being able to send us alert if something were to happen. So there's really not that much of a need. And when you do a redundant ring like that, you, you incur a lot of cost. You, now you have more fiber optic cables you have to put in place than you had before. And did we really get anything? Well, not really, because usually those follow the same exact path as the other one did. And so if you have one fiber cut, the other one is probably going to be cut too. So what we what the better solution is to have one fiber path um, or, you know, in our ring and then have some reporting or uh, learning features, and that's what the G3 would allow us to do. Okay, and uh, uh, Peter asks again, uh, what is the advantage of having defined a defined ring master over a solution where the lowest MAC address becomes the ring master automatically? Well, we, we're able to say where the ring is. Like uh, RSTP, for example, which is uh, kind of the IT data world's redundancy protocol, um, it, is, it, it selects the, uh, the root bridge, which is equivalent to the uh, ring master. Um, it's selected by the lowest MAC address. Well, the problem with that is the lowest MAC address is the oldest switch that you bought because as the manufacturer builds new switches, that MAC address it increments up. So your oldest switch would be your ring master always. Well, you normally want your fastest switch on the network, the most successful switch on the network, to be the master. So if you, if you let the MAC address just decide which one it is, like I said, you would, you would have probably the least efficiency that you could possibly get. Okay, very good. Uh, that's all the questions, and we've, uh, we've uh, completed an hour. So uh, we're running out of time, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, this webcast will be available for reviewing at windpowerengineering.com. And we also invite you to visit redlion.net slash together to learn more about Redline controls. And lastly, you can follow Wind uh, Power Engineering on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Uh, this concludes our presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. And from the staff here at Wind Power Engineering Development, we wish you a good and productive day. Thanks. Appreciate it.